uh, coming to the stage to be interviewed to uh, uh, keep me company here is uh, a good friend of mine. His name is uh, Kevin Baker. So just a little background on him. He's an, he's an award-winning novelist, best-selling author. He's written fiction, nonfiction, so many incredible books. It would take. He's a Guggenheim fellow. The guy's a brilliant mind, an incredible guy. Please welcome to the stage, Kevin Baker. <laughs> All right, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Cool. Yeah, of course. Of course. I, sorry, I, 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 kind of, I kind of went quickly through your intro there. When I saw you walking up, I was like, oh, crap, I got to go through this. <laughs> I would have spent a lot longer. You got you such a long resume. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll just get started. Get started with a little chat here, huh? Here we go. This, is, this, this ain't your grandma's interview show, <laughs> you know? All right. First question. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Nice to be down the Lower East Side. Good, good. I'm glad. Okay, so let's get right into it. So you have, I've read a couple of your books. Um, one of them is, uh, is called The Fall of a Great American City uh, about New York. Spoiler alert. I don't know if you guys knew that. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting book because it, it, not only do you talk about your love for the city, obviously, but you talk about how the city's changed. You talk about how we have to, you know, fight to make it and change it. Uh, there's a great part where you talk about where you say um, the, the trouble lies in the inexorable fact that cities change and it is our job to preserve them what's best about them so when you say that it's our job to do something what do you mean specifically what do we do right well cities do change yeah. and if you know they're supposed to change and if they don't they become venice which is a terrific place to visit but it's it's basically encased in amber you know it's kind of stuck there beautiful place but if you're going to have a living city, you really do need to change. The question is how the city changes. What do you preserve? What do you let go? You know, what's better? And for many years, New Yorkers, I think, always felt everything got better. You know, you had uh, Grand Central Depot, this lovely little Victorian uh, train shed. They made it into Grand Central Station, you know, one of the great architectural achievements in the world. Uh, everything was better. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't better and things started kind of getting worse. And we started just kind of mindlessly tearing down things mm -hmm. and building stuff that's simply taller and taller and not better. You know, you, you had that great picture of those uh, super tall buildings yep. that are now surrounding Central Park. And it's to the point where kids in Central Park now, a lot of places, have to wear sweaters on very sunny days because they're Yikes. actually overshadowed. You know, and the buildings themselves don't work very well. Apparently, like, uh, J-Lo and A-Rod yeah. had an apartment in one of them, and the, the building was so terrible, mm. was so wretched, making so much noise, yeah. twisting back and forth, that they quickly sold it and got the hell Oh, it was terrible. Hell I, hell I hung there. out there all the time. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't just watch Netflix in peace. It was terrible. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. I think you're, you're right. I think, uh, but the question then becomes, though, as, yeah. as individuals, yeah. what do we each... Do then? Well, how, how do we change? Because I feel like that's a, a consent. There is a consensus that things, a lot of things, are changing for the worse or getting out of control. But what can we actually do? Well, we we got to have people in charge who actually have a vision for this city. That's a vision beyond simply filling it with more rich people. Mm -hmm. You know, this can't just be like the world's largest gated community. Well, yeah. You know? So wasn't it Bloomberg? Bloomberg actually said straight up. He said flat out. He said if New York could have more billionaires, that would be the, something along those oh, lines, yeah. like the yeah, best possible be thing. Yeah, that would be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like you actually courted billionaires. And he succeeded, actually. New York is the highest concentration of billionaires with their primary residence in the world. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, and, yeah, so, yeah and, real and sick. You can, <laughs> real you can sick. see the difference in yeah. that. Uh, yeah, this, New York was recently named again the richest city in the world, yeah. which it's been pretty much off and on now for decades. Yeah. Uh, and yet, the Bronx is the poorest urban county yeah. in the country and has been for the last 50 years mm -hmm. you know and, yeah. and my my feeling is let you know make the bronx great again like, <laughs> what, like what are we doing you know oh boy what what are, what are we doing about that why is this impossible why does nobody even have this vision of kevin i got some bad news for your bronx slogan better? i got some bad news on that slogan <laughs> someone someone kind of beat you to it i don't know if you uh if you've read the news lately uh, you might have some trademark issues there <laughs> Oh, you know, I forgot to put this up. I forgot to put there. There's, there's uh, Kevin. Yeah, I forgot. Look at that. There's me right there, a little bookworm. All right. Uh, cool. Well, let's keep it moving. Next question then. So, so why? So, with all the change that's happening, I, I thought what struck me about the book too is that you called it the fa the fall of a great American city. So there is changes, and it is necess it isn't necessarily good always. But why is this the fall compared to let's say the Gilded Age or compared to other times in history? 
Right, that, that's you know more the editors who wanted you know okay. kind of kind of wanted <laughs> they like, want explosion. They, they wanted Where a polemic it? on the thing, <laughs> but it is kind of the change. You yeah. know, there was a woman who uh, I'm blanking on her name uh, a few years ago wrote a, a pretty good book about uh, uh, Eighth Street in the in the village. Eighth Street is oh over. Ada Calhoun. Ada Calhoun, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. And she was a, a pretty good book and about how you know everybody's always saying Eighth Street's done. And you know, because like the th places that were dance halls and bars became stores or became what, and now they're kind of, uh, you know, what you were saying. And now, so they're, you know, so they're bank uh, ATMs, and it's sort of like, okay, you know, a, a store is one thing, and a movie theater is one thing, and a bar is one thing, but a bank ATM is another thing. Yeah. There's no, there's yeah, no exactly. culture you can have off a bank ATM. You know, we're getting to the point now, a lot of the places in this city, first floor, it looks like the Depression. And above, everybody's millionaires. That right. happened, happened to my neighborhood on the Upper West Side. Yeah, no, more and right. more empty storefronts, you know? You had a good uh, a part where you spoke about how it's becoming kind of like a frat house mentality where, where the businesses being set up are for transient people, are people who are temporarily. So one of the reasons you have, actually, you know, Jeremiah Moss talked about this, where you, the reason you have cupcake shops and ice cream parlors every two, every two storefronts is because everyone's here basically on vacation for two years, and then they leave. You don't have laundromats. You don't have real bodegas. You don't have like the things that people need to exist and like put down roots because people don't need them. It's all a homogenous group that isn't here that long or isn't here that often. Yeah, and he has a pretty good book too, Jeremiah yeah, Moss. Yeah, Vanishing New York's a great book, really, but, really great book. But he, uh, but yeah, you see, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, for a while in our neighborhood there were a, a dozen pharmacies all of a sudden because they can make the overhead with the with basically uh, prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden there were a dozen of them, and then and now they're kind of all gone. Now we have all of a sudden we have like five buzz shops on the block, yeah. you know, all these pot shops <laughs> and they'll, they'll be gone in another year yeah. or two. You know, meanwhile, more and more mom and pop businesses are getting wiped out. They're being asked to pay rents nobody could afford. Mm -hmm. So so these are actually business. These aren't like defunct or terrible businesses. These are places that actually make a profit. One of them got wiped out. This great bagel shop, Lenny's Bagels, a 98th and Broadway, everybody in the neighborhood loved. Their their monthly rent went up from twenty eight thousand to thirty eight thousand oh a month God. a month you know, and wow. you know people just can't it's a lot, lot of bagels yeah. you know yeah. and it's a and more and it's a vicious cycle more and more people can't buy anything right so like the uh, you know more and more like the lobby of my uh, my apartment building uh, you know is like filled with uh, boxes where everybody's right. like asked to order from somewhere for right. it you know. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, uh, the, the term, I think, is high-end blight or luxury blight, yeah. where you have all these stores that are empty, they're vacant, because they can't, because it's such a prosperous neighborhood that no one can afford the rent. And the, the landlords, this, I think it's interesting, people always say things like gentrification, but when you get down to like minutia, how does it actually work? Well, one of the things that happens is landlords see the trend rising, and rather than lock someone in at a, at a commercial lease for 20 years at, a, at the rate that it is now, they basically gamble and say, well, let's just jack it up to what would be two years from now, because I don't want to lock them in at this. And so it stays empty for two years. And they just wait until Citibank moves in, because no one, no cupcake shop or anything is going to be able to afford that. And even they're the only ones who can take the loss on, a, on, a, on an actual. So it's interesting, but that's one of the ways that it kind of manifests itself. And, yeah. and sometimes, you know, we, we have met the landlords and they is us, you know. Yeah. Uh, more and more, these are kind of co-op boards, right. condo boards who decide, like, ah, let's get rid of that monthly maintenance fee, shall yeah. we? And we'll, we'll, like, triple the rent of the store down. So in a way, they're taxing all the rest of us. But. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a crazy time, <laughs> you know. But I, I think that I think it's a. It also is. Um, you were you were mentioning, for example, the stores. For example, you, you mentioned Adel Calhoun, and she said St. Mark's is dead, right? But but I think it's interesting because it can be overwhelming. But I think if we focus on the individual stores, like there are lots of whenever something is in threat of being closed down or something like that, people always come to the rescue or they fight or they push. They get motivated to participate, and I think that can possibly give you some motivation and some hope too, right? Because otherwise, you feel like, what can I possibly do? I hope so. You know what's weird? Because you know, I, I despise the Republican Party, but mm -hmm. we, we need it. We need another party that's not just a bunch of, you know, what's what it's now kind of the lunatic nihilist party. You know, and we need people who offer actually other good ideas. Because right now we have a lot of leaders we elect. They're so radical. They talk such a radical game, and they kind of don't do anything, and they just sort of elide a lot of the problems. 
You know, like the, the other day when we had fire in the sky there, you know, three weeks ago, the, the New York City Council passed a law mandating composting. As, as if like, you know, that was caused by improperly buried vegetables or something. <laughs> you know, it's like this has to be, they have to address, they have to do the hard things. They're all getting lots of money from the developers. Yeah. It's very cozy, yeah. but they, they got to address what's going on yeah. and they're not. Yeah, no, you're right. I think uh, another thing to keep in mind, too, is it's a result, too, of policies at the federal level and the state level over time. You know, the city's been starved of cash. They're kind of their hands are tied in a lot of ways in some ways that they can't they actually can't do anything. And they have to appeal to the tax base. They have to get rich people here because that's the only answer that they can see in there. So they have to treat themselves like a corporation with the bottom line and all that. Um, but, you know, to be more hopeful, <laughs> you know, it's starting to, start to get out of here. Um, you wrote another book that I really liked. Uh, it's called uh, uh, America. This is Us. Uh, it's gonna, yeah, America, the story of us. The story of us, sorry. Companion volume with uh, the A&E. Uh, yeah, series. History yeah. Channel, like all that little history thing. Um, really good book. It's basically like a survey of all of the United States history. It's an incredible like dive into everything. And it's got pictures in it. <laughs> yeah. What's your excuse now, guys? Huh? Ch charts, too. Lots of charts, charts and lists. Colors. Oh. And, and celebrities telling us uh, things they think they know about America. That's right. <laughs> celebrities. Lady Gaga. No, I'm just kidding. No. Spo spoiler alert, Ann Coulter knows nothing about colonial America. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ann Coulter, everybody. Uh, no. uh, okay, so I, I love that book. I thought it was very good. Uh, but I guess to be more hopeful, what, what would you say is the lesson of the United States? Because the history is so rich. The history is so short also compared to the rest of the world. What would you say the lesson is, uh, having studied the history as deeply as you have? I'd say that the lesson is that a free people can do anything for, for good or bad, you know, and we usually have while we're here in America. You know, it's uh, a, working on a book now, uh, History of the United States Between the World Wars. And, you know, it starts off a really horrible period. In 1919, we had um, a, uh, you know, 36 uh, major race riots around the country, all white on black attacks. We had more people on strike than ever before, a higher percentage of people on strikes than ever before in the U.S. and ever since. Um, all the strikes crushed, all the unions broken. You know, had the Red Scare, all this kind of terrible persecution going on. And we came out of that. We found ways to come out of that, you know, hard period, brutal period, but one of really increased democracy, uh, you know, built a freer, better country, or at least started that way and crushed you know, worldwide fascism at the end of it. So it's possible, but, uh, but we have to want it. We have to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I guess that is, that is true. I think that uh, that's a good point. I, I like, I, and I thought the book was great, and you really did cover everything. But yeah, the, I guess there have been bad times before. You know, we come out, we come out. I think one of, the, one of the interesting things, too, is I think the United States is similar to New York in a way. I always told people on my tours back in the day, I used to be a tour guide. <laughs> no, no big deal, Kevin, <laughs> you know? I know you write your fancy done that, books. Done that too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You did that too, I guess. Uh, you've done everything. Uh, but I used to tell people on my tour, one of the things I love about New York is that New York is never really done. It's, in, it's always becoming New York. And New York is an idea. The idea of New York is open, is accepting, is, a, is de democratic, is all of those things. So it's our job, like you were saying before, it's our job to preserve, but it's also our job to keep New York, New York and keep it becoming New York because it's never done. There's always gonna be something wrong. People always look back to the 70s like that was the time to be just because hip hop was invented, but it was a nightmare here. Like you had to, you know, you're getting mugged, it was a mess. So there were, there were things to be, uh, you know, fixed back then. I guess it's our job to kind of find what it, New York should always be and push towards that, no? Well, I, I first came to New York in the 70s. Right. And I loved it. In part, I loved it because I was young, and you always love the time when you're young, <laughs> you know. But also, yeah, it was dangerous. It was dirty. There were cockroaches like you wouldn't believe. You know, a lot of things wrong with the city. Uh, but also, things were very cheap, and it was very exciting. Right. There was a lot of cultural stuff going on. There was a lot of places to go dance, a lot of stuff like that. You know, it, it was fun. It was, it was a terrific you know, place. I think now too many people, too many young people are probably being priced out of the city. And I think that's, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I guess we're at, we're just gonna have to fix it tonight. We got we got 25 minutes to fix uh, fix New York. Suggestions welcome. Let's see if we can get through these questions. Maybe we'll fix it. Um, no, but so one of the things that impressed me a lot about you and your and uh, and what you've done is you've written so much. It's, it, it, and I know that sounds like wow, what's writing? Well, <laughs> you know, but no, I think it's incredible. You're 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 just a prolific writer. You've written fiction, nonfiction. You've written articles. You've written, I guess. Of all the things you've written, what do you prefer to write, fiction or nonfiction? What do you what do you feel is? I, I prefer writing fiction. I think of okay. myself as a novelist first, okay. but recently I've been writing a lot of nonfiction, and that's Why is that? interesting too. Uh, you know, just various interests I've had in doing, like this between the war book I want I've wanted to uh, do for quite a while. Uh, you know, just kind of got to it here. You know, something sometimes depends on what sells. Frankly, you know, what there's a market for. Um, you oh, know, we're going to see you TikTok <laughs> dancing pretty soon, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and man, read read fiction, buy fiction, man, it needs it. You know, people yeah. are it's it's hard to sell that now. But yeah, it's tough. To it's uh, the way. the book market is tough. Um, yeah, it's uh, I guess I guess people just don't really read as much books, huh? I guess that's what's happening. I think I think people read a lot of books, but it's just it's hard to hit that certain niche, and for some reason we've turned away from fiction, particularly men. I don't know why, but men don't. Yeah, uh, well, that's actually one of the reasons I asked you the question. It's common to to find, especially among men, it's almost like a they like discount fiction. Like it's almost like too unimportant. Like with everything going on in the world, you're gonna sit and read Lord of the Flies or whatever the hell you know. What are you doing? Like actually read about what's going on. But I think that I think that it's uh, you know obviously very important as well. You know I think what fiction does is you know nonfiction tells you what's happening. You know it tells you the past, but I think what fiction tells you is what's possible in many ways. You know and and gives you a different way of looking at what's happening. Um, but yeah, I I read, <laughs> you know. I I I, mean, I, I always make I, I know I have th I tend to have things in my novels like yeah. you know bayonet charges or or rat baitings, which was one of the popular sports here on the Lower East Side, you know. So things Yikes. like you know, th things like that attract men, but sure, <laughs> it's, it's hard to otherwise R rat baiting. <laughs> that you'd bet on how long it took a trained rat terrier yeah, to sure. kill a hundred rats. No, this I know. Is, this is actually the most popular sport in uh, in Lower New York for a while. <laughs> yeah. That's actually the show after ours. Uh, um, I saw actually, too, uh, that, you, that you, did, um, you did, you were a guest on uh, Stephen Colbert, on uh, Colbert Report back in the day. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, real quick, before you, before you talk about it, uh, this show's better, right? Oh, definitely, okay, cool, definitely. Right. Okay. okay, cool. But what was that like? Was it, it was like being lowered into a box with a very friendly monkey. You know, I, I, was, oh my God. I was absolutely terrified. He was, he was an incredibly nice guy. He was at a show incredibly, you know, and, and, the, and his staff warns me beforehand. They said, like, you know, don't try to, don't try to joke with right. Colbert. Don't out And I said, yeah, I'm going to joke with Colbert. And then I'm going to go out and dunk on LeBron. You know, yeah. I'm just going to, you know, like, of course I'm not going to joke. I'm terrified. But, yeah. but he was very nice. I got through it. I got to meet Meryl Streep, who was another guest back oh, there. Nice. So, fantastic, fantastic experience. Meryl Streep was the other guest on the show? Uh, she was doing a later one. So oh, she, but he, cool. she taped the segment there. So oh. then we all, we all sat at her feet and were goggle. <laughs> she's, a, she's a guest uh, next month, by the way. <laughs> Meryl Streep will be here next month. Um, so, uh, for someone who's done so many different things and so many, uh, I guess, artistic endeavors, w what advice would you have to uh, aspiring artists here in New York, especially now when it's so difficult to live here and more expensive, et cetera? What would you say to someone looking to get into something like writing? Well, I mean, a basic thing for writing is write. You know, really, sit down and write. I mean, I was, that's the thing I learned. I, I just, you put in the hours, yep. you know. No, no, you know, just thing that can replace that. I would say also read Read it widely, read as much as you can, you know. Um, I, I have a friend who's a, who's a writing teacher, and he says that the, well, a student of his was telling him she, she doesn't see a need to read anybody who was writing before 2005. And it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta oh. read, gotta read yeah. everything. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's actually another good point, too, I, just to piggyback off you. Um, it's interesting because I think. Everyone in the world has dreams. You know, everyone in the world has something that they would want to do or eventually want to try or whatever. But I think the big thing is, like you just said, just write. 
It's like you want to be a writer, just write. That doesn't mean you're going to become Stephen King, but you're going to write. And, you're, and the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. The longer you do it, the more that'll become your world, and you never know what it'll take you, you know? It's a good, it's a good way for organizing yeah. your mind in any case. Sure. And it's also, uh, that teaches you the discipline of it. Sure. Sit down the, I used to sit down and try to write five pages a day uh, on Hackaway on my little Smith Corona portable. Uh, and that was, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of the writing was awful, but... Uh, it got better slowly. Nice. That brings up our sponsor, Smith Corona Portable uh, Typewriters, <laughs> for all your typewriting needs. Uh, no, it's true, though. I always, I always think, like, in, in any office building, in any part of the country, really, I mean, you never know what, like, dormant idea is sitting up there in a cubicle. You know, how many amazing novels, how many amazing screenplays, business ideas just sit there and wither away? You know, and, and the only difference between those people in those cubicles and a lot of the people who actually do the things is doing it. That's it. It's not necessarily talent or anything because you never know if you have it because you never try it. Uh, but I guess that, that, that coming from someone who was withering away in a cubicle, <laughs> that's what, <laughs> holy Lord, that was a nightmare. Holy Lord, I got out of that. Uh, missed the benefits, I'll tell you that. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a much happier life. Okay, so we reached the point where we are going to the rapid fire questions. This is a very important part. Here we go. Setting our, look at that. Oh no, your face is on fire. Holy Lord. Yeah, I got some special effects. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. Took me three hours to do that. All right, let's do this. All right. Favorite city outside of New York? Uh, you know, Paris or Rome, but that's... You Paris. Know, Where's our Par Parisians? We Paris Par is amazing. <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in this city, uh, I haven't been there in a while, but, but I think San Francisco. It's such a, you know, <laughs> such a physically, yes. physically <laughs> beautiful city, you know? That, that's, that's the reason why Vertigo works. Sure. You know, it's a ludicrous plot, but it's like you're just kind of drifting through this dreamlike place, and that's, it, you know, it's... It is a pretty amazing place. Uh, yeah. Talk about unaffordable, though. Holy Lord, that yeah, city. And all kinds of Yikes. Although, I will say this. One of the things about New York, I used to say on my tours as well, is that uh, New York City, one of the beautiful things about New York City is the boroughs, is the fact that we have four other boroughs in Manhattan. But if Manhattan was New York City as it used to be before 1898, it would be San Francisco. It would be unaffordable. Think about that. Like that's what San Francisco is now. I mean, Man if Manhattan was just New York City, that would be it. There would be no, you know, the subway, the the, the welfare programs, all that stuff would, would cut off the outside, and it would basically be commuting into a, an unaffordable city. And still fewer people, I think, in Manhattan now yeah. than were back then. Yeah. 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 Came after these other boroughs. Yeah. All right. Digressing. Digressing. Let's keep this going. Here we go. What is the? This is a good one. You've been here for a long time. You came here in the '70s. What is the craziest thing you've ever seen in New York? I, I, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, just in general day-to-day -day life in the 70s, you had things like you had legless guys begging on the subway. More sure. than one who kind of had these boards that they would kind yep. of move through yep. with the subway cars and between the cars, which was stunning but horrible, you know. Sure. And, and a, on a kind of nicer note, I once saw a uh, fire department uh, station uh, answer a fire call at another fire department. <laughs> I, I guess they had rushed out and left something on the stove or something. So, so they it just was, like pulled it out was, and then went into another one? It was kind of weird. There was, a, there was a one, you know, another one came and, and oh, put out a really? fire at this other fire station. Yeah. That's like, weird. Like, like what? <laughs> it, I was watching this happening. Like, what, what? What's wrong here? You know, was there like def <laughs> uh, effective, uh, equipment defective or something? I, or no, I, I don't know. They went, I mean, back in the, you know, you know, there's back in the... In the 19th century, the fire department. Why would I know that, Kevin? Huh? <laughs> Why would I know that? Being a tour guy, they used to they used to fight over the, who get the first yeah, the right? hose That's right. on the That's hydrant. Right. You know? That's right. They used to fight. They actually, so fire departments. This is kind of funny. They used to recruit like tough guys because they part of the the job of being a firefighter was fighting. When you would get to a fire, you had to fight the other fire department to see who would put out the fire. <laughs> So they would just hire a bunch of fighters on there, and they would just show up and just start brawling. That was, it's insane. It sounds like I'm making that up, but that's true. That's true. Some things have improved in the city. Yeah, some things have improved, I guess. <laughs> Those were the good old days. Okay, let's keep it moving. All right, who to you personifies New York City? Um, I, I like to think Robert Caro personifies okay. New York. Guy with a, you know, 
wonderful scholar, terrific old school New York accent, just been writing away and exposing corruption and mm -hmm. terrible things. And you see his book all over the place, The Power, Power Broker. Power Broker, yeah, maybe those the, guys who don't know. Maybe the best book ever written yeah. about urban politics in this country. Some of country. you guys might use that book yeah. as doorstop. A doorstop? I don't know. It's, well, it's I, huge. Well, I noticed, you know, since since COVID, when they're having all these uh, interviews with yes. people on Zoom, yes. everybody has it in the background. Yes. But that's, that's great. true. I fear, I fear too often our persona is like Andy Cuomo, but uh, but <laughs> I, I I hope not. I hope we're more Robert Caro. Than yeah. Andy Cuomo. Okay, Robert Caro. All right, cool. All right, let's keep it moving. Pizza or bagel? Well, you know, it depends what time of day, but I I guess bagel. bagel. You know, uh, particularly if missing our our wonderful bagel shop. Nice. Um, you know, I, V and T pizza still. You know, get some of it from the uh, B and T pizza uh, is your favorite. Up, up on uh, yeah, well, just okay. more sentimental than anything. They they it, they didn't used to deliver in the seventies because they're right next to Columbia, and so many students would order it and already be asleep by the time they, <laughs> they showed up. So yeah. you used to not be able to get it out, but yeah, <laughs> now well, they do. I will say that's safer than the old like student uh, trying to cook bagel bites yeah. at night and passing yeah. out, and you're like, why is there fire in the, in the hallway and someone just passed out cooking bagel bites? Or so I hear. <laughs> okay. All right, what place in New York City most represents New York? Like, if you were to have a visit or something, where would you take them and say, here's New York? Here, here, right around here. Not, not here, but here. Uh, oh, my heart <laughs> jumped for a second. I was like, am I about to cry? But Lower East Side, yeah, yeah. people have been coming from all over for 180 years now, more. You know, uh, African Americans escaping slavery in the South, uh, Irish and German immigrants, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants, uh, Eastern Europeans, Hispanics, people from the Caribbean, you know, it's everybody, wave after wave. It's an amazing record. I don't think there's anywhere else in the United States where that's really been the case. Yeah, no, the history here is insane. The history here is insane. I, 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 uh, I covered it in one of the tours in the past shows, actually. <laughs> you know, you should check it out. It is, uh, yeah, it's on YouTube. I just All put it on YouTube. Here. Go, I go put it on around afterwards. All yeah, around. Thank you. I'm, I got to plug my stuff up here, you know? <laughs> so you guys don't know who the hell I am. All right. Well, anyways, what's your favorite NYC movie? That's, that's a hard one. There's so many great ones. That great opening of Manhattan, you know, with the, uh, the Rhapsody in Blue playing mm -hmm. and the beautiful shots. Uh, all the way back to like things like the crowd, the silent gray with the wonderful panorama of shots. I guess, <coughs> excuse me, I guess overall I'd have to give it to the apartment ah, by, a, yeah. by a hair over Sweet Smell of Success. Sweet Smell of Success um, is good too. They're yeah. both, you know, it's just wonderful. That, that Just that scene where Jack Lemmon is kind of dancing uh, uh, drunk, uh, uh, kind of against Hope Holiday when they're in a bar, you know, the, the, the drunken Santa Claus, uh, beautiful young Shirley MacLaine, and it's so much about, it's poignant, it's funny, it's also kind of sad, it's a little yeah. hard-edged. And it is kind of like the New York situation of having a cool apartment in New York yeah. and being and having like that currency. And you everybody know? wants it. And know, everybody wants great, a piece of it. Yeah. Great Billy Wilder film. Nice. So, the Godfather, you know, Godfathers 1 and 2 are amazing historical films. Sure. And they really show what the, city's, the city looked like in those times. Mm -hmm. Godfather 2... Best recreation of old New York I've ever seen. Yeah. Apparently, that was created in part by because the, they were burning something you're not allowed to burn now, some kind of like tar-based thing. So everybody, you know, got more cancer. But it but it looks <laughs> it looks terrific. So yeah. a lot of cancer back then. People were getting lots of cancer and the stuff they did. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So what's the what's the last book you read? Uh, I read uh, uh, Martin um, uh, Baumol. Uh, Duberman's uh, biography of Paul Robeson. Paul uh, Robeson. For, for work. You know, it's right. I, I read a lot to what I'm work, writing on, but, you know, and he, he really amazing figure in the between wars period and a tragic figure, but a great man and a great, uh, great history. You, you, know. you read lots of biographies, huh? A lot of biography, a lot of history, yeah. Uh, You're a big history buff. So, yeah. Is that what you studied in school? Actually, a poli sci major, which is silly. That's you know. Oh, is it silly? That's exactly what things. I studied. <laughs> what are you, my dad? <laughs> should, should have just done history. <laughs> no, poli sci. I thought poli sci was kind of interesting. I, I, I almost did the minor in history, but poli sci. Yeah, I could see why you'd say it's silly. So you, you didn't want to go to law school, huh? No, I was. I figured, you know, I was going to give writing a shot, and if I had not sold anything by the time I was thirty, I was going to go to law school. That's and, so funny. Uh, 
30 came and went, and uh, you still, you I, stuck with it. I wrote every day for uh, 15 years before I sold any fiction. Yeah. So, and then, that's great. Know, so, thank you. Listen. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You guys are nice. Very that's slow. actually it's very important. Actually, it's funny. That's funny you mentioned that. When I went to law school, there was a woman who was who's starting around the same time, and she'd started law school. I guess a few years after me, I, I went straight out, and she said that she's going to law school because she was giving acting three years to succeed, and if she didn't make it, she was going to go to law school. And everyone was like, "Are you kidding me? Three years? What kind of an actor are you? You know." You're not going to hire a plumber who's going to give plumbing two years and then go back to some... Like, you, you, no one's going to take you seriously as an artist unless you're 1,000% committed to it, even if you don't make a living off it. I'd rather hire the person who lives and breathes what they do and doesn't make any money than the person who's like, yeah, I guess I'll try it, you know? Anyways, that's a sore spot, <laughs> you know? Like a, okay. All right, so one, one more question. Uh, one more... This is a very important question. Okay, Kevin, are you ready? All right. All right. Will you... Be my friend. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. We did it. I'm racking them up. I'm racking them up. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I'll take that off your hands. Thank you very much. Have a seat. All right.